Hey everyone, today I want to talk about the difference in the engines between the GT350 and the GT500. Now, these engines in these cars are completely different from each other, and I've often heard people refer that to that the GT500 engine is the same as the GT350, except it's cross-plane crank with a supercharger. Now, while these engines do share some characteristics, they both have the same engine block, they're both dual overhead cam 32 valve V8s, and they have the same bore and stroke, that's pretty much where the similarities end with these engines. These engines are constructed completely differently, they make power in very different ways, and they make the characteristics of the cars very different from each other. So in this video, I wanna go over each engine individually, show how they're constructed, how they're set up, how they work, and then go over also the dyno truck to show exactly how these engines make power. Now let's start with the GT350, the 5.2 liter Voodoo V8. 526 horsepower and 429 pound-feet of torque. When Ford set out to build this engine and build this car, they wanted it in a package that was light, nimble, and very well balanced. And they decided to go a very non-traditional route to build this engine. They decided to use a flat plane crank. Now that really became a buzzword when this car came out, but flat plane cranks were really nothing new. They had been used in a lot of exotic cars for a very long time, especially in cars like Ferraris. That's actually where Ford took the design inspiration for this engine. They took apart a Ferrari 458 engine and basically looked at how it was constructed and used that as inspiration for this engine. What is very different about the engine in a 458 from this engine is this has a very unique firing order on it compared to a Ferrari engine. Whereas Ferrari engines typically are very high pitched and scream, this thing still has a very traditional V8 rumble to it. It is different from a cross plane crank V8 sound but it still sounds like a V8. Now, in order to keep the engine weight down as much as possible, Ford used a lot of plastic components in non-structural areas. The oil pan, the intake, the cam covers, the coil covers, all that is plastic to help keep as much weight out of this engine as possible. They also used an open style air intake on this. As air goes in through the intake system, into the intake manifold. It has very long runners on it to help promote some low end torque for this engine. As air goes through the runners into the combustion chamber, it goes past the port only injectors. Ford did not do direct injection on these engines. The good thing about that is you don't have to worry about the intake valves getting dirty over time like you, you traditionally have to worry about from direct injection. So the, the gas always going over the intake valves keeps them nice and clean. As air enters the combustion chamber. In order for this engine to make a lot of power, they needed a lot of high compression because this engine is naturally aspirated. You have a 12 to 1 compression ratio for this engine, which is pretty high for a naturally aspirated OE engine. You also have a lot of cylinder pressure, 1,200 pounds of pressure in the, in the cylinder of this engine. Now also one of the ways for this engine to make power is through a lot of RPMs. This engine redlines at 8250 RPMs. That was also a really big thing. The fact that this was an American V8 going over 8000 RPMs. That was also a really ma main characteristic for this engine. The way it's able to do that is you have a very light rotating assembly. That's one of the main characteristics of flat plane crank engines and allows them to rev so high. The internals are very lightweight compared to a traditional cross-plane crank, especially the crankshaft. They take a lot of weight out of it compared to a, a cross-plane crank, and it allows it to spin much faster. That's how you can get that very, very high RPM. And as well as the rest of the rotating assembly, since it's naturally aspirated, they're able to make the pistons and the connecting rods relatively light as well. And as air goes out of the engine, it goes through a set of shorty style headers that they've used on various other Mustangs before to help promote good engine flow. Now the characteristics of this engine because of the flat plane crank design mean you have mid to high range power. Down low, you really don't have a lot of power. So in order to really extract the most out of this engine, you are very busy when you're driving this car. You have to keep it basically between 4,000 RPM and 8,000 RPM in order to really get the most amount of power out of this engine. So you're always working, you're always making sure you downshift early to keep this engine in the power band. That is the natural characteristics of the flat plane crank engine and what makes this different from traditional Mustangs like 5.0s, this engine does not have a lot of low end torque. It really doesn't have any low end torque at all. 
So this engine characteristics are extremely different from the GT500, which I will get into now. Now the engine in the GT500, the 5.2 liter Predator V8, 760 horsepower and 625 pound-feet of torque. When Ford set out to build this engine, they wanted to make an absolute powerhouse. In order to do that, they had to strengthen a lot of components and they went back to a traditional cross-plane crank. Because cross-plane crank engines typically have a much wider power band, unlike flat-plane crank engines that need a lot of RPMs in order to make power. Now basically, in order to make this much power, you need a lot of air and a lot of fuel. Now the byproduct of all that air and fuel is that this engine generates a tremendous amount of heat. And Ford had to take that into a major consideration when designing this engine and designing this car. With the car itself, they wanted to get as much air out of the engine compartment as possible. Much larger openings on the front grill, the massive louvers on the hood, they put heat insulation around the engine bay itself and they closed off the air box. Unlike the 350 has an open one, this one is closed to keep that heat from saturating the intake. It has a much larger opening in the front, so when you're going down the road, it basically has a ram air effect to help get as much cool air into the intake as possible. With the engine itself, the main issue was they wanted to get rid of all of the plastic components that the GT350 had been using. The plastic oil pan, the plastic cam covers, the plastic intake, all gone. The only real plastic part that this engine uses from the 350 were the coil covers. That's pretty much it. Now, when you open the hood on this car, the most obvious thing is the enormous supercharger that Ford put on this engine. This is an Eaton reverse flow twin screw 2.65 liter supercharger, almost identical to the one that was used on the C7 ZR1 Corvette. This supercharger consumes a tremendous amount of air, especially for an OE setup. This supercharger is almost half the displacement of this engine. Now, as air is brought into the supercharger, here's where this is much different from previous GT500s like the S197s or even the Terminator Mustangs. Traditionally, those would bring air in through the back of the supercharger. With this engine and this supercharger, air is brought in through the front and is brought in through the bottom of the supercharger. It is then forced up through the air-to-liquid intercooler and then goes around the outside of the housing for the supercharger and it is forced into the cylinders. What's also nice about this engine is Ford stuck to port injection only on this engine. So having port injection means you don't have to worry about the intake valves getting dirty like you do in direct injection. You always have fresh fuel washing over the valves and making sure they stay nice and clean. Now, as air goes through the runners into the engine, this is where things get very different with this engine. In order for this engine to survive this much power, they had to beef up the rotating assembly considerably. So the rotating assembly in this engine is much stronger than the one in the GT350. Now, the compression ratio is much lower in this engine. It is a very supercharger-friendly 9.5 to 1. However, with this supercharger forcing so much air into this engine, the cylinder pressure is increased by 50% compared to the GT350. You have 1,800 pounds of pressure inside this cylinder when the engine is running. So you have a massive increase in cylinder pressure, and that's why they had to upgrade a lot of even the small components of this engine to make sure that it would be able to survive that massive increase in pressure compared to the GT350. Now, this engine does have a slightly lower red line than the 350. This red line to 7,500 RPMs, which honestly I think is really good considering this is a cross-plane crank and it has to turn this enormous supercharger. 7,500 RPM is still a really high red line and this thing revs hard all the way to 7,500. It doesn't run out of steam when it gets towards the top. It goes all the way to red line with the power. And when air is exhausted out through the engine, it goes through a set of shorty style headers, similar to the ones on the GT350. They've been doing that in the Mustangs for a while as a way to increase the power and flow from these engines. Now, I cannot say enough about how much power this engine makes. It is a powerhouse. It makes power, like I said, all the way to red line. It does run out of steam when it gets towards the top. It makes power down low. It makes power up high. It makes it absolutely everywhere. And it makes the characteristics of this engine dramatically different from the GT350 engine. You don't have to build RPMs in order to make power with this engine. Now to really help show how these engines are different, I wanna show also the stock dyno charts from these cars 
so you can see exactly how power is made through the RPM band of both of these vehicles. Now let's start by looking at the dyno chart for the GT350. Now both of these dyno charts are rear wheel horsepower. So this is the actual power that both of these cars put to the ground. Now obviously atmospheric conditions can alter your power output significantly, but these are both a pretty good ballpark for these cars. So for the GT350, as you can see, the power does build throughout the rev range, especially for the horsepower. Now, like I was saying before, these engines make very little power down low, these GT350 engines. At 3,000 RPM, you're making about 150 horsepower and probably around 280 pounds of torque. So down low, really not a lot of power. But one of the most noticeable aspects of this dyno chart is the power pickup between 3,500 and 4,000 RPM. That is a relatively small window of only 500 RPM. And you're going from about 180 horsepower to about 260, 270 horsepower. And same thing with the torque. You're going from just over 300 pounds of torque to about 375 pounds of torque or so. So that small window sees a massive power increase as this engine builds speed. And when you're driving the car, you can absolutely feel it. That's why the engine needs to be between about 4,000 and 8,000 RPM to really make power and really move the car. Both the horsepower and the torque build pretty well throughout. The horsepower pretty much builds all the way to redline. The torque stays relatively flat until you get to about 6,500 RPM. And you can see it starts to kind of taper off from there until it gets the redline. But the horsepower builds pretty much all the way your max horsepower at 7400 and the torque's kind of in the middle at about 4900 rpm so a little bit different than a cross plane crank but it's what you would expect from a naturally aspirated engine where it builds power throughout the rev range now the GT500 is a totally different story. It's what you would expect from an engine with either a lot of displacement or forced induction. Now, the colors for the torque and the horsepower are opposite on this dyno chart, but as you can see, the horsepower, just like the GT350, does build throughout the rev range, but the torque is a totally different story. That is basically like a plateau, and this thing makes tons of torque everywhere. Whereas the GT350 at 3,000 RPMs, there was basically nothing going on with that engine. At a mere 3,000 RPM in the GT500, you're already at 300 horsepower and over 500 pounds of torque at 3,000 RPMs. That engine hasn't even started really running yet, and you already have diesel levels of torque available. And I have absolutely noticed that when you drive this car... The back tires tend to break loose even when you're not trying. When you're not even pushing the throttle hard, you're not pushing the engine, and those tires can just easily break loose on you. See that that torque curve stays above 500 pounds of torque until it gets to about 6,500 RPM. So the majority of the rev range in the GT500, you have over 500 pounds of torque at the wheels themselves. It doesn't really start to fall off until you get past 7,000 RPMs, and you're basically at red line at that point. So max torque is pretty much in the middle of the rev range. And as you can see from the horsepower, a nice linear build all the way through, basically until you get to red line. Max power is just over 7,000 in the GT500. And it's absolutely incredible the amount of power this engine makes. You don't have to wait for this engine to make power like it does in the GT350. The power is pretty much available all the time, and the horsepower just takes over all the way to red line. So I think this is, these dyno charts are a pretty good indication and understanding of how these two engines that are the exact same displacement from the same block make very different power in two completely different ways. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.